Okay, so we are here at Sensei Ferro Boys de Jacques, world famous Team Karate Centers in Woodland Hills. And today I have the great honor and pleasure of working with Guru Graciela Casillas, two time world champion, simultaneously boxing and kickboxing, and uh, amazing at the Filipino martial arts as well. So that is what we're going to focus on today. Guru, thank you so much for having me today. I am really looking forward to learning from you. Thank you. I am 51 years old. I've been a practitioner of Okinawan Shodin Ryu Karate since I was seven. There were some who would call me a master. I assure you, I am not. I believe that the true expert is someone who still has a student's heart and a beginner's mind. This year, to celebrate turning 52, I'm setting out to learn from 52 other disciplines, each from its own master. Some things I've tried before, Others, I'm a first day beginner, like anyone else. 52 weeks, 52 new skills. I'm William Christopher Ford, and this is 52 Masters. how a basic counter use against if somebody's attacking you with a stick you can apply first you're going to do it stick against stick and then I'll show you how it goes stick against empty hand so if you go to strike let's say I just stop it here and I hit from here and hit your elbow and hit okay so that's basically you doubt with the attack coming at you which when I strike I'm going to strike at you now okay you block it you go to the midsection okay then from there you come back and don't, not so far, keep it short. Sure. From here, you go like an uppercut to the hand. Right, and then, you, and then you come over and you hit one more time. Just like that, right. So keep in mind that when you have a stick, you want to try to use the last two to four inches. Mm. This is not as effective as hitting here. So okay. try it again. Last two four inches. The last two, so I strike at you, hit, right there. Okay. And in reality, it won't matter later, and then you go to strike again. Because the point is that when you strike at me, if I can here, come here, I can come down, mm. or from here I can come up and hit, it doesn't matter. But it's just basic. Hit. This is for you to bow back or see you checking with that radial nerve. Mm. Okay, so from here, you're going to come around and hit one more time. Okay? So try it again. Here. Nice. That's it. Then just practice hitting with the last two inches of the whip. Last two inches. It, you just have to think, I mean, it's just, it just with time. Great, perfect. Now let's get your body behind it. Okay. So when you strike from this position here, I can do this, which is arm, but from here on, I want my body. Mm -hmm. I'm using torque, I'm, using, I'm shifting my weight, so I'm using my, my body to hit. Mm -hmm. So this is my body, shift with my body, check, and I drop down, you drop the hip. Yeah. So now try it. Hip, there you go. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Good thing you didn't hit me. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was nice. Do you see the difference yes. when you get your body behind it? So that's your basic counter. So what if you didn't have a stick? So let's say I don't have a stick and you're coming at me. The same exact movement. You strike, I come in here, now hit here. I could come with my knuckles, I come with my elbow. Same thing, I hit, except I switch. I'm not gonna, I could hit the radial nerve, but I could come. I don't want to waste this motion from here as I'm coming to hit. I have this, then I have this. So 
But if you look at it, it's the same movement. When you strike from here, I went here, I went here, I went there. So same thing, mm. okay, with or without the stick. So that's amazing. <laughs> so, no, so you do the same thing. So you, there you go. You can replace it. Okay. You can, in your case, you would go elbow because you have a longer reach. There you go. And then you would move out, move out of the way. Okay. Okay. So out of the way. Up. This one right here. Yeah, and then and that could be a break right there. Okay. Do you see? And then you come over and rotate with your hip, with your elbow to the head. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Understand. So. So try it again. Relax, yeah. Relax, and then just right where you're at, you want economy motion, so you bring it right over, over, not up. Put like you're wiping your oh. face, the back of your hand. Exactly. This one. Perfect. Hi. Okay, one more time. So I'm here. There we go. That. Exactly. Interesting. Perfect. So that's the end of the hand. Okay. If I had it, you don't have a stick, and you have to defend. The exact same movement now applies to a punch. It's here. Same movement. The only difference is I would move away. Okay. So again, slow motion from here. Check, check, hit, elbow. From here, come across, and I hit the arm. Okay, and I'm checking you. <laughs> yes, okay. So try that. Okay. So, pretend, think about when you have the stick in your hand, the movement doesn't change. Exactly. But you hit, you would hit and go through, right? That's it. And if you want to go over, you would go over. Mm. Perfect. At the back of the hand. Too. I always say, I tell, I tell students, if you punch at me, and I'm just going to go for the elbow, it's like I'm wiping my nose. <laughs> just like that. That's the way I want to make contact. Interesting. Right, because now it's in tight. Because otherwise, if I throw an elbow out here, I need more space. But if I'm in here, from this tight, I could just mm. I could make contact just by keeping it shorter. I have a, a challenge with... Um, for myself with distance, mm -hmm. judging distance, mm -hmm. not knowing, am I too close, am I too far away, you know, so uh, that's been a, that's, that's something I'm working yeah. on. Yeah. yeah, that takes time, but you just have to, one of the most important things as a student and when we're training is to be able to troubleshoot our own, ourselves. So if I go to punch you and I go, oh, but see my elbow is bent, I know I was too close. Mm. Good reaction. <laughs> so I'm going to know next time that this was not good. I'm too close and I'm close to you or I'm there. So I'm gonna, it's just awareness. Now I know I'm too close, I have to practice, okay. But now, now this was better for me. So I'm more aware of the distance and the range and know that it's gonna switch. Like when you extend your hand, just extend your hand and I extend mine, see how the difference? So you have a much longer reach. So it's gonna be different. Your range is gonna be different with me than it is with somebody equal size. So it's awareness and, and Repetition. Yes. Repetition. I always say the difference between a beginner and a master is practice. Mm. So a lot of practicing with the right awareness and knowing you know, what the issue is with my distance. You, you didn't change the technique. It was it's the no. same technique, but you just that the wonderful thing about the Filipino martial arts is like like one is the same for this, the same for this, the same for this. It's the same principles. It's just that. The, the tools are different. Yes and no, more or less. It could be exactly the same, but the beauty of the Filipino martial arts is that it never has to be the same. Hmm. So even though in the beginning I might teach you that you're going to deflect, hit the midsection, on the other hand, if I decide to do something totally different, same initial movement, but you strike at me, I can come here, and then hmm. there's that abanico we were working on. It can be anything I want it to be. Hmm. It doesn't have, there's no set pattern. Hmm. Once you learn the principles, you can do whatever it is, whatever your body, however your body responds mm. to whatever threat is coming at you, there's no right or wrong. Mm. So you can be as creative as you want. Now, there's some four basic ranges. There's the long, the medium, the short, and the grappling range. Is that correct? Right. Okay. And when we, go ahead. So once you're in close, you can throw me, take me down, with or without the stick. You're, you're, you're that close. I can give you an example just off of the same move. Let's say you strike at me and I go here and here. Mm. Okay, this is, now I'm grappling. This is a throw. Yes, I don't want to throw you. I just want me to throw I you. do want you to throw so me. Is, stay. Okay, so that's my grappling range. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love it. So Did now, you, see, yes, this time I don't have a, 
Okay. I don't have a stick. Right, I have okay. stick. You have the stick. Okay. So you strike again. <laughs> that was the exact same movement. Awesome. With without the stick. Mm. The only thing, the difference was that the stick, it would have been a punya to the side brachial stud. Yes. So that initial move, slow motion, when you come here, this is the brachial stud. If I had the stick in my hand, take you with me? If I had the stick in my hand, it would be here. I'm hooking. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is helping throw you. Or, if I really want to be mean, I would go with the butt of the stick. But I know, I'd be a really nice person, so I'm going to do that. But I'm here, and now I'm using circle. And it could be shorter, it doesn't have to be a big throw, it depends if there's space. That was a lot of fun. Um, even when I got thrown by Master Casillas, and I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. What a great lesson. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's fine. <laughs> now, you've been doing martial arts. Um, you were 15 years old, and it was Taekwondo being taught at your church. Mm -hmm. And then that was the beginning of your journey. That was the beginning of my journey. And I probably would stay with Taekwondo except mm. the class ended. So mm. I went, I sought out the local school, which is a Farangdo school. Okay. And I thought now, you know, when you're young, you don't really appreciate some of the things that happen. But now that I'm older, I realize that uh, Grandmaster Juban Lee used oh. to drive out twice a week and teach our class. Mm. So he would come from down into Oxnard mm. and teach. So I stayed there for several years mm. until I moved on, transferred to UCSB. Juban Lee, definitely one of the greats. You yes. Know. Um, yes. You know, I had all his books, you know, um, and uh, you know, I used to... Magazines, books, you know, I, anybody who was on the cover of a book or magazine, I just, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so Yeah, I, I was lucky because we had him and then we had Bob Dugan, mm. who actually ran the school, and it was okay. his school, who also was a phenomenal martial artist. Well, we want on those, you had the kicks, like yeah. Taekwondo, but then you had the, the joint manipulations and the walking and the throws. And I know that uh, you eventually went on to study Japanese Jiu Jitsu. And what were maybe some of the similarities and maybe some of the differences between Japanese Jiu Jitsu and Huarangdo? Um, well, I think it was more the application. In Huarangdo, we did do joint manipulation, but it wasn't as extensive as in Jiu Jitsu, and the throws were a little bit different. The throws are a lot more circular in Huarangdo, and where in Jiu Jitsu, you know, we're using the lower in your body, more like the hip ogoshi or hip throws, okay. and, you know, Sionagi, they're, they're just a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. I guess the best way I could say it's that in some way Huarangdo was a lot softer but mm. explosive, mm -hmm. whereas Jiu Jitsu is, it wasn't this, it's not necessarily a harder art, but as compared to Huarangdo it was. Mm. And this was the Japanese Jiu Jitsu, not, yes. not the, the Danzanru. Okay, interesting. Um, boxing and kickboxing kind of made you well known because <laughs> yeah. you were simultaneous undefeated champion in boxing as well as kickboxing. Right. How would you get involved for that? Well, I was at the local Quadrant Do school here in Oxnard, mm -hmm. and uh, I got to the point where I, was, I had gotten my red belt, which is the equivalent to brown belt in other arts, and I, and I was already thinking I want to teach, but I never got to apply what I was learning. Mm -hmm. um, Grandmaster was not in favor of us going to tournaments because so it was too political, and yeah. he just wasn't very supportive of that. So that's when I found out that there's a local Kempo school, the Flores Brothers Karate, down the street, and they were fighting. Mm. And I said, wow, they're fighting. They're mm. like going in the ring, and it's full contact to the knockout. And I thought, wow, wouldn't this be awesome to be able to see if what I'm learning works? And that's how I got involved. And back in those days, it was called full contact karate, yeah. later kickboxing. Mm. And that's how I started. I was trained with Refugio Flores, who was also a champion yes. and a great martial artist. And um, we were just all training together and and fighting, you know, fighting and whatever fights we could get. Mm. I remember the Flores brothers, yeah. uh, Refugio yeah. Flores and Jesus Flores. Exactly, they're st and they're still active. They used to bring their students. There was a they had a student named Elgin Betancourt. Oh yeah. A little kid, mm -hmm. but he was like, man, this kid's gonna like take over the world. He was, yeah. it was amazing, even at the, and I hear now he's a you know, master and yes. seafood, but I've always liked the Flores brothers. Uh, They're the, great family, great yes. martial artists, and yeah. they still have their school in Oxnard. They're still 
I mean, they have incredible longevity. Mm. And I think very well respected. Um, one of them trains over at Guru Inno Santo School. Yes, that's Jesus. Okay. Yeah, I, I believe he's, he's a guru now in Durban, that's, too. That's fantastic to hear. So you got involved with the, the, the kickboxing through that? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then. How did, like then, and then how did you go from kickboxing to boxing, or was, did you get a boxing well, coach? You or? have to understand in the 70s, uh, full contact karate was not that popular mm -hmm. to begin with. Now, being a female in the sport, it was really difficult to get fights. Mm -hmm. So eventually I went from, when I graduated from UCSB, I moved to Los Angeles because I wanted more training. I wanted to be even better. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be more professional. And I was basically, my fighting style was that of a slugger. So I would take a beating. Mm. I was always getting hit. And even though I'd win my matches, I, I, I looked awful afterwards. And I didn't want to keep getting hit in the head. So um, when I started training, I started training boxing. And our trainer took us over to the Urquidas family to train with Arnold Urquidas. Mm -hmm. And that's when I met Lily. And, and Lily, to me, she was my idol. She was like, she was a mentor for me. Mm. and. I learned that she was boxing, mm. and I thought, well, this is really cool. The difference is boxing, kickboxing, you just keep your feet on the ground, and you box. Well, it wasn't that easy, <laughs> I learned, but that's sure. how I started supplementing, because I thought I could I could do full contact karate one month, and, mm. then, and then train for a boxing match maybe the next couple months, mm. but you know, you have to understand, those days, you might not fight except once or twice in a year, because mm. you just couldn't get the fight, mm. so it was mm. very, very discouraging. So that's how I made the transition to boxing. I, I saw a fight of yours on YouTube, uh, and I think the, uh, the, the your opponent's name was Roxanne. I'm not sure. Um, Rochelle Ragsdale. Yes, you know, uh, with with no disrespect, disrespect intended to her. But I watched that and I noticed it's like, oh, you know, she's really, you know, you're hitting her a lot in the body, uppercuts to the body, hooks to the ribs, and then I'm noticing this. And you guys go back to your corners, and then when you come back, the fight's called because they discover her ribs were broken. Right. Did you know that her ribs were broken when? Well, no, of course not. I, I didn't know, but I have to say, in her defense, she wasn't my original opponent. Mm. My, I was supposed to fight um, Irene Garcia, and she hurt her wrist. Okay. So, so. I don't know if she had enough time to train. In other words, I'm just saying she wasn't originally the opponent I was mm. supposed to. So, so I, I definitely had more skill than she did. Mm. And she put up a hell of a fight. Yes, though. she yeah. did. Yeah. And um, as you know, what I learned in boxing that kind of set me aside and, and helped me because I only trained with men. Mm. And where I was training at that point in time at the Olymp Olympic Boxing Gym, all of the men that I trained with, most the majority of them were even in the top 10. There were mm -hmm. several world champions there. Mm -hmm. So I had access to that type of training. Okay. And my, la my sparring partner for my last fight was Hector Camacho Sr. And he would help me prepare. So one of the things that I learned was to be a good inside fighter. Mm -hmm. And women didn't know, weren't really taught how to go to the body. In mm -hmm. fact, men weren't. Mm -hmm. So I became very strong inside. Mm -hmm. and. I love body shots. I loved <laughs> uppercuts. I, that was my strength. I could see that. Because I was, I was always shorter than my opponent, mm. so I was taught to move in, slip that punch, get in, and stay in as mm. long as I could. Who was your toughest opponent? Elba Melendez, Cookie Melendez from New York. Mm. I would say that she was really tough, mm. very strong, very strong, really great fighter. Is she still around? Yes. Mm. In fact, we're friends on Facebook. Oh, okay. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But yeah, so she was your toughest. She was, she was a very strong fighter. I did, mm. I, I mean, I won the, the fight, but, but I mean, I hit her with everything, everything within my power. Mm. And she just stood there and, you know, it was, it was just, it was a tough fight. Amazing. She was really strong. What led you to the Philippine Martial Arts? It has to do with my fighting, you know, at the time, and I've told the story before, I was friends with, and, with Paul Maslach, who was uh, the editor, I think, Inside Kung Fu at the yeah. time. Yeah. And he was trying to help me because I was sort of the new kid on the block and I was training with Steve Fisher and Howard Jackson. Oh, yeah. I was still living, I was, before I made the transition to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and and he was concerned about the way I was fighting because mm -hmm. he said, you take it I was taking a lot of punishment. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, I was always getting hit in my nose. This is like two surgeries after I retired just to put it back in the middle of my face. Mm -hmm. And uh, so even though I retired and defeated, it did not look that good. <laughs> right. So um, 
So what happened is he said, you know, I've got the great, a perfect trainer for you, a teacher that will, that's going to help you. Mm -hmm. So that uh, you're not taking such a beating. So you learn. I didn't know what a triangle was. I didn't know what a diagonal. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to move on diagonals. And it took me over to Guru Den and Santo School and introduced me to him. And that's where I started, when I started, and I was like 19, I don't know, early 80s. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that you know, the school goes through different phases, and they were, you know, they, there's like the Jun Fan, Jeet Kune Do, and they were doing, and then there was the Filipino martial arts, the sticks. And even though I was supposed to be more focused on the Jun Fan, and I did learn, you know, I, I became a better fighter, I learned footwork. I heard the sticks, and there was just something about the weapons. Mm -hmm. I had never trained with weapons prior to that moment mm -hmm. and I just fell in love with the Filipino martial arts. I did I was kind of bored with OG Kung Do only because a lot of it reminded me of the kickboxing, what I've been doing for years in mm -hmm. the boxing. You know, a lot of you know the footwork step and slide, a lot of you know just the timing drills and all that. It wasn't as interesting to me as the Filipino martial arts. Mm -hmm. And so I gravitated more towards that and just really love the art. I just I love the footwork. The angles, exactly. The fluidity and the power that comes from the fluidity um, in, in the Filipino martial arts. And I love the versatility of going from stick to blade to exactly. empty hand to grappling, you know, to you know, to mong, you know, and, and and things like that. It's 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 really quite amazing. I think the biggest takeaway I've had from the Filipino martial arts and what I really um, appreciate and what I value is that Filipino martial arts, as you know, there's thousands of items, different styles, everybody, I mean, I always say there's only so many ways you can make a fist, right? I can punch you this way, I can go horizontal, I can go back this, but there's only so many ways to do a certain movement. Well, the Filipino martial arts, there's only so many angles. There's so many ways to hit with the stick, but the beauty of the Filipino martial arts is that you're free. Free. You're free to truly evolve. What other arts talk about, and you know, being a pointer of the way, and, and being able to evolve your own style. The Filipino martial arts really allows you to do that because there's no set way of doing anything. There's no. I always tell students there's no wrong way of doing. It. There's more effective ways, but there's no wrong way. Like you know, students will say, "Oh, I'm doing that wrong." No, you're not doing it wrong. It's just there's a more effective way of doing it, possibly, maybe better alignment, better using body torque. But um, that's, to me, what I love so much about the Filipino martial arts. It doesn't matter what style. It doesn't matter who you're training with. It's just, it's truly just adding and helping you evolve yourself as a martial artist. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really cool. What led to you writing your book, The Lion is Within? Which I do have, and, and <laughs> you were kind enough to sign it for me. And it is really very, very good. What led to that? Well, I, I had been writing for years, you know, I started at 19, I'm giving my age away. I started when I was five years old. 1986, I started writing for Karate Kung Fu Illustrated, and mm -hmm. then I ended up writing for Karate yeah. Illustrated, and eventually, Black Belt and Inside Kung Fu, I had columns in each mm -hmm. of those, plus yeah. other Blade magazines, and mm -hmm. every time I wrote, I always thought, you know, I want to write a timeless piece, something that's more principle-based, if possible, so that someday, it, you know, I could put this in a book form. Mm -hmm. But more important than that, it's that I've kind of been out there, and I've looked, and I've looked, and I would spend hours in Barnes and Nobles with my daughters, because that's one of our favorite things to do, is to go to the bookstores and hang out there and see what's there. And, and I saw a lot of self-defense books, but having my educational background you know, as a counselor, an academic counselor, having a master's degree in education, I really started thinking about the fact that there is nothing out there that really addresses the more emotional or the psychological aspects of personal survival. It's all about, okay, step one, two, three. And I just felt that what women needed is something that really focuses on the mind, not the body. I mean, there's, there's so much out there to teach you how to throw a kick, how to throw a punch, but there's not enough out there that's teaching how to train your mind. How to you know how to see conflict, how to see you know how to deal with an assault situation. Yeah. So that's why I felt the need that I wanted to share my experiences and, and write about what I've been through to a certain extent, and what other people I've worked with, other women have gone through, mm -hmm. and hope that it might make a difference. Yeah. Let's say this is your last day on earth, and you have one last class to teach. What would you like to impart to your students? What would be the thing? Hey, guys. Remember this. 
what would that be? If it were my last day on this planet, <laughs> so to speak, and I think the most important thing that I could teach a student is it's not so much a physical concept, it's a more of a, the concept that you, you truly, and this may sound like a cliche, but you have to understand why do things become, why do statements become cliches? Because they tend to be true no matter where you're at. And I truly believe that the answer is you have it within you. I truly believe the first master had no teacher. So when you feel down, you feel like, oh God, you know, I don't have anybody trained with whatever, you have to remember that you have the answers within you. You don't really need, it's nice to have other people, but know that you have enough within yourself to move on, to continue to move forward. When I lived in West Virginia and I came, relocated back to California, I left students out there and they were like, oh, I can't train her. I looked at my student Debbie, who's my highest ranking uh, black belt there and I told her, I taught you enough that if you never took another martial arts class, take what you've learned and evolve it. And that's something I also learned from Guru Dan. He used to say, you know, something similar. Um, you can take you can take what you've learned and you can make it your own. And I think that's really important to to have that confidence and say, okay, I don't have somebody else, especially during this time period that we are so limited. That to know that. You don't need anyone else. You need yourself and start with you. And I think that's really important. Well, um, I want to thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, I, I had uh, such a good time. Thank what you. an honor and a pleasure to be able to spend time with you, to train with you. And I really appreciate you sharing a little bit about your life. Oh, it, was and about you. <laughs> it was my pleasure. It was my pleasure throwing you around. <laughs> thank you. So, once again, this has been 52 Masters with the great Guru Graciela Casillas. I'm William Christopher Ford, and we'll see you next time.